Or was he born 14 years later, <clears throat> at the time when Augustus Caesar commanded Cyrenius to carry out a census for tax purposes? Matthew's Gospel says the former. Luke's Gospel, the latter. Why didn't Josephus or any other contemporary record the massacre of the infants that Herod purportedly carried out after learning of Jesus' birth? Why didn't Seneca or the elder Pliny record the worldwide darkness that attended Jesus' death? Why did none of the more than 60 secular historians and chroniclers who lived between 10 and 100 AD not record any of the deeds of this God-man. Why wasn't it until some 60 to 90 years after Jesus' purported birth that sketchy tales of his career were told by the pseudonymous authors of the four Gospels? Why didn't Jesus write his own autobiography telling the story straight from the horse's mouth, as it were. <clears throat> if he was God incarnate and had a care for the future of mankind in this world, not just in some kingdom yet to come, why didn't he make permanent contributions to science and medicine rather than putting obscurantist barriers in the way of understanding phenomena like mental illness? which he ascribed to evil spirits. If he really existed in flesh and blood, why did so many Christians, the Docetists, early Christians, the Docetists, believe he was nothing more than a ghost or apparition? If he really was God incarnate, why did it take a majority vote of the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD to settle his status? Why is the Jesus myth modeled on countless other myths of dying and rising again deities such as Osiris, Adonis, Tammuz, Odin, and Mithras? Ask yourself enough of these questions about what it would be reasonable to expect to be the case yet isn't, and you'll see for myself the force of my cure arguments for his non-existence, my cumulative case from unfilled, unfulfilled rational expectations. Was there an historical Jesus? Albert Schweitzer asked the question in his Quest for the Historical Jesus, 1922. But an answer will elude us forever, unless we're given clear criteria as to what would even count as a positive answer. If you ask me whether there was once some ordinary man, a traveling magician perhaps, or the character depicted in C.K. Stead's delightful novel, my name was Judas, who lived around that time and about whom the myths gradually grew, I'm agnostic. But if you ask me whether a miracle worker existed who fills the bill of the Bible story, I'm confident the answer is no. About the historical existence of that Jesus, I'm confidently atheistic. Apparently, the Talmud recall, uh, recall, records the death and life of a man whose description resembles that of the biblical Jesus. But that Jesus, Jesus ben Pandera, was hung from a tree on the eve of Passover during the reign of Alexander Janaeus, about 100 B.C., I leave it to those who still think they might establish the historicity of Jesus to say whether Ben Pandera might count as the historical person they are looking for. The intellectual credentials of the pagan gods, I said earlier, turned out to be abysmal. 
The same holds for the intellectual credentials of the biblical God. We have the best of grounds drawn from reason and experience to dismiss that God's main claims as scientifically and historically fraudulent. Were God to submit the Holy Scriptures as part of his CV to any appointments committee who did their homework, they'd dismiss him as a charlatan. Sad then that over half the world's population has appointed him CEO in the citadel of their belief. How about the moral credentials of the biblical God? They are worse by far than those of the Huitzilopochtli's of paganism. <clears throat> Worse even than those of Satan, biblical personification of evil. Why this harsh judgment? Well, God provided the grounds for it in his CV. For those who've never read it, or who, having read it, have forgotten or turned a blind eye to its contents, I offer a few reminders. First, this God not only appropriates to himself (coughs) the pagan God's discredited role as direct cause of natural phenomena, such as earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, floods, lightnings, plagues and famines, this God also boasts of repeatedly using them to maim, injure, starve, drown, and in many other ways, kill off millions upon millions of people, every living thing on the face of the earth at the time of the great flood, according to Genesis. Disease and disaster are God's weapons of mass destruction. Or so, in effect, he tells us. Second, this God in his role as commander-in-chief of his chosen people and role model for all his followers, orders the slaughter without compassion of hundreds of thousands of women, children and suckling babes, condones slavery and human sacrifice by fire, threatens to make people cannibalize their parents, husbands or wives and their children, threatens to to have unborn children ripped out of their mother's wombs and seems to relish the prospect. Third, this God in the person of his son Jesus envisions the vilest of all possible fates for the majority of mankind, torture of infinite duration in the fires of hell. For the record, There are at least 13 passages in Matthew alone in which Jesus talks about the fate of those who will go to hell. A fate that he describes as eternal, as fiery, as a place of unquenchable fire, as a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. St. Paul, in 2 Thessalonians, looks forward to the time when, in his words, the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his, fiery, with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God.